It's hard to imagine that the last few years of your life have been spent with potential liars and traitors. It's extremely hard to comprehend. I thought that I had built a good and strong marriage, that I had a real friendship, and in general I was surrounded only by close people. But it turned out not to be so. Everyone was hiding something from me and eventually everyone will be punished for it. Couples started arriving at my house nearly 30 minutes late, despite my request for them to arrive by 7 this evening. It seemed each couple was trying to time their arrival so they wouldn't be the first. Consequently, two couples' cars arrived at my driveway around 25 past 7. My dad's truck, with him and my stepmother, Mama Connie, arrived just five minutes later. As I was still in the living room, asking Larry and Angela Klug and Roy and Mary Jo Chastain about their drink preferences, Dad and Mama Connie came in through the front door without knocking, as they always did. While I was preparing drinks for the first two couples, Dad went to the kitchen, grabbed two beers from my fridge for himself and Mama Connie, and joined me as I served the others their drinks. I had already opened a Bud Black Crown when my guests began arriving. After ensuring everyone was comfortable, I settled into my easy chair, facing them across the coffee table, except for Dad and Mama Connie, who sat near the piano to my right as I faced the others. The conversation had been limited to basic pleasantries and exchanging minimal information about drink preferences, along with expressions of gratitude. However, the heavy emotions of sadness, grief, anger, and humiliation stemming from the current situation with myself, my family, and friends made engaging in light conversation difficult. There was no talk about children, social activities, or work, especially not about marriages, particularly mine. You see, this morning my wife Jamie received divorce papers at her workplace due to adultery. Her reaction was not like desperate calls as one would expect in such a situation. I believe that after seeing two photographs of her and Doug Stevenson in compromising moments, as well as transcripts of their conversations obtained with the help of my private investigator, she realized the depth of her infidelity. It appears that Jamie had chosen to adhere to my written instructions by retrieving the bags I had prepared and left on the front porch, containing the essentials for her temporary relocation. My grandfather had left me the house's sole ownership upon his passing six years prior to our marriage, and I had changed the locks after she left for work this morning. In writing, I informed Jamie that I had placed the remainder of her belongings, along with most of our previously shared items, in storage on East Brainerd Road, just east of downtown Chattanooga. I hadn't received any communication from her except for one note she apparently left in my storm door when I returned this afternoon, simply stating, I'm sorry. The room fell silent as soon as I spoke, and all eyes turned towards me, absorbing my words. I had my lawyer arrange for Jamie to be served with divorce papers at her workplace this morning. I didn't say it loudly or with any discernible anger in my tone, yet the impact was profound, akin to a shouted proclamation. Conversations halted, and everyone turned to look at me. For a moment, even movement C said. I was certain that news of my actions had already reached the two wives, and likely the husbands too, before I uttered a word. I focused my gaze towards a central point, avoiding direct eye contact with anyone, disregarding the expressions on their faces. It didn't matter to me whether anyone showed awareness, shock, surprise, innocence, or none of those emotions. Tonight's meeting wasn't primarily about announcing the end of my six-year marriage to Jamie, but rather about mapping out my immediate future, moving forward, as politicians in Washington like to say, to give the illusion that their actions are leading towards some sort of positive outcome. It's a meaningless phrase, crafted by Washington focus groups. Clint, my dad finally broke the silence after about five seconds. Are you certain there wasn't anything you and Jamie could have done before serving her papers? Or perhaps even now? When I hesitated to respond immediately, grappling with my anger and frustration over multiple unfolding situations this evening, Mary Jo Chastain, being naturally the most outgoing of the group, remarked, Mr. Hood, given how well I know your son, I'm certain he considered all the options before acting towards Jamie. She gently placed her free hand on Roy's arm as he silently contemplated her words. Under different circumstances, 
I might have appreciated Mary Jo acknowledging my ability to manage conflicting emotions, but not tonight. Just three months ago. Yep, Clint, Roy remarked to me, agreeing with my observation. It certainly appears to be a clandestine meeting from my perspective as well. Roy and I were enjoying a beer together after catching one of the numerous basketball games playing on the large screens at Buffalo Wild Wings. I had just remarked on what seemed like suspicious activity in the distant corner. She, a bottle blonde in her early thirties, had entered the bar about an hour earlier with two other women. He, a man in his late thirties, sporting a sharp suit and wingtip shoes, clearly out of place in a sports bar, had arrived alone just ten minutes ago. Considering how swiftly he had navigated to the corner of the room after receiving his drink at the bar, and how promptly she had separated herself from her group to join him in his secluded corner, it was evident that they had either arranged this encounter beforehand, had done this before, or perhaps both. Observing the rings on their respective left hands, it was clear they were married, and other cues strongly suggested they were not married to each other. Hey, Roy. I inquired, reflecting on the recent changes I had observed in Jemay's affection and interaction with me, which were definitely not for the better. What would you do if you recognized either one or both of those cheating jerks while out in public like this? I mean, of course there's the risk of informing the betrayed spouse and having the one you tell become angry and hostile. But don't you think the deceived husband, in the case of the cheating wife, or the deceived wife, in the case of the cheating husband, as deserves to know. Roy didn't originally hail from Tennessee. He relocated from New York after completing his studies at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and securing a position at the Department of Energy in Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Later, he left ORNL and settled in Chattanooga when he was hired by a local engineering firm four years ago. Our introduction took place shortly after Roy and Mary Jo's move at a book signing our wives had dragged us to at the local Barnes & Noble. We discovered we were neighbors, exchanged dinner invitations, and Jamie and I welcomed them into our circle of compatible couples among mutual friends. Having known Roy for several years now, and noting his enduring New Yorker traits, I wasn't particularly surprised by his response. Nah, too many complications. Besides, the truth always surfaces eventually in such matters. Why risk tarnishing a good friendship with a lasting, unpleasant memory? So, I countered, you're suggesting you'd simply stand by and say nothing. What if it involved the spouse of a dear friend? Wouldn't that hold any significance? Roy twirled his glass on the small raised table where we were enjoying our wings and drinks, pondering his reply. Eventually, he said, Well, I suppose if it were a close friend, someone I really cared about, not just a work buddy or someone from our social circles, I might reconsider and feel compelled to inform the poor guy. I chuckled at how much of a Southern influence Roy's wife, Mary Jo, seemed to be exerting on him, nudging him to soften his staunch, stay-out-of-it mindset rooted in his upbringing near the Red Hook neighborhood of Brooklyn. I inquired, You'd want to be informed if it were Mary Jo, wouldn't you? Never going to happen, he retorted sharply. Then he took a swift sip and slammed his glass on the table, displaying his irritation towards me, simply for entertaining the thought that his devoted wife could stray. Relax, buddy, I reassured. We're just speculating here, you know. I'm not accusing anyone, I just want to know that my friends would have my back if, well, if they ever noticed. I hesitated, then continued. Jamie, engaging in any inappropriate behavior behind my back. I took a gulp of my beer. You understand what I'm saying, Verna? The mention of the old Ernest P. Worrell commercials with Jim Varney prompted Roy to chuckle and soften his previously hostile demeanor towards my words. I laughed along with him, pretending that everything was cheerful and optimistic. But inside, a growing darkness loomed that I couldn't hide much longer. After I revealed my plans to have Jamie serve today and received brief responses from Dad and Mary Jo, silence lingered for a few more moments until I spoke again. I've also initiated legal action against her unpleasant boss by serving him with papers alleging alienation of affections. In addition, I have ordered another set of documents to be sent to the local vice president of their company regarding non-compliance with the company's policy on inappropriate intimacy between employees who are married to other persons.
I took a moment to collect my thoughts before proceeding, ensuring I conveyed everything in the right order. I was determined not to lose my flow or spoil the surprise I had planned. His mood noticeably soured, particularly when presented with evidence from my private investigator, confirming that many of his employees, including some in managerial roles, were aware of my wife's ongoing affair with her supervisor, but chose to remain silent, merely gossiping about it among themselves in the break room. The expression on my face undoubtedly grew darker as my anger mounted, both at the recollection of what had transpired and the extent of collusion among my wife's co-workers in her affair. Sensing the tension, the other couples in my living room wisely stayed quiet, allowing me to vent uninterrupted. Yeah, it's interesting how alienation of affections lawsuits aren't permitted anymore in Tennessee. However, because I had photographic evidence and eyewitness statements confirming that Jamie and that jerk shared a room in Charlotte, North Carolina, during a legitimate business trip three months back, the judge in Mecklenburg County, which covers Charlotte, allowed my lawyer to proceed with the case from there. It appears the locals there receive a portion of the legal fees from such suits, regardless of the outcome. Clint, you must really have a strong grudge against that company to go to such lengths for a lawsuit, remarked Larry. Oh, it's deeper than that, my friend, I replied, still seething but realizing that tonight would mark a significant and permanent shift in several relationships. I retrieved a leather-bound folder from the coffee table, extracting a manila envelope from within. After confirming it bore the correct mark, I casually slid it towards Roy across the table. Roy accepted the envelope, exchanging glances with his wife before querying, What's this, Clint? Have a look, Roy, I replied calmly, deliberately keeping my emotions in check to resist the urge to confront him and his disrespectful wife. As he lifted the flap and emptied the contents, his eyes widened, and his mouth hung open as he began to breathe rapidly. I'm serving you, friends, I said calmly, though I wanted to yell at him. What? You? Are you crazy? Roy exclaimed, attempting to regain his composure. Roy, dear, Mary Jo interjected, now sitting upright, worried about her husband's reaction to what he was reading. Roy glared at me, too upset to respond to his wife, so I clarified for him. This is formal notice of my intention to file a lawsuit under North Carolina law for alienation of affections against Mrs. Mary Jo Chastain for, and I quote, malicious conduct that contributed to or caused the loss of affection. Those are the words, and they state that, as a direct and proximate result of the negligent, wrongful, and reckless misconduct and behavior of Mrs. Mary Jo Chastain, the plaintiff, that would be me, has suffered damage to the affection and consortium with my wife. In simpler terms, I continued before the previously confused Mary Jo, now the very angry Mary Jo, could speak. You, Mary Jo, were aware of what was happening, having received a first-hand account from my wife, and chose to conceal it, perhaps even endorse it without informing me. You despicable person, Mary Jo retorted, now fully composed. Alienation of affections. Me? I am not her lover. Serve these papers to that man, Doug, she's been involved with. I glared at her, my expression filled with bitterness, and addressed her. Mary Jo, did you know that Jamie and I had a love before she got involved with Doug? Mary Jo seemed puzzled by my question, but she nodded, and always one to speak her mind, replied, Yes. You two were sickeningly sweet with each other. It was clear you were in love. But... I cut her off and pressed on. Has the love Jamie and I shared as spouses been compromised, strained, perhaps even destroyed because of her relationship with that jerk, Doug? Mary Jo sighed and reluctantly admitted. I suppose so, but... I continued. So, did your behavior, by not informing me, along with the direct actions of Doug by engaging in inappropriate intimate behavior with her, you are contributing to the loss of Jamie and I's affection or becoming the cause of it. And you were aware, or should have been aware, that Jamie's interaction with Doug would lead to the rift between her and me. Listen, Clint, Roy interjected, now defending his wife. You need to face reality here. We've been friends for a couple of years. You're accusing U.S. of being the villains here when it was your wife and her boss who... 
Mary Jo, growing agitated, cut off her husband. Regardless, you can't substantiate your claims about any of this, and as you mentioned, there's no law in Tennessee covering this. Ah, uh, I retorted with a deliberately patronizing tone and expression. But, as I mentioned earlier, there's tort law for this in North Carolina. Mary Jo hesitated, gathering her thoughts for her next rebuttal. Before she could respond, I added, Remember the girl's week in Nag's head? I arched my eyebrows as I spoke. Mary Jo paused, her eyes narrowing as she tried to recollect the trip she took with my wife, Jamie, their friend, Angela Klug, who was now seated beside her, and even my own stepmother, Mama Connie. Jamie and I own a timeshare condo in Kissimmee, Florida, note to self. Need to nudge my lawyer to take care of getting Jamie to take the timeshare in the settlement, since those damn things are otherwise too hard to get rid of normally. We also belong to a timeshare swap consortium that allows us to trade our yearly vacation week unit at our place in Kissimmee for the use of another unit at one of the consortium's member resorts elsewhere in the U.S., just about three months ago, right after she and asshole Doug had begun to do the nasty Jamie, my wife, had arranged a girls' week at a resort in Duck, North Carolina on the Outer Banks, all of the small communities in that area being referred to collectively by the locals as Nags Head. Jamie, along with Mary Jo and Angela, had arranged their vacations to allow them to go together. At the eleventh hour, I suggested to Jamie that she bring my stepmother along, hoping for some additional adult supervision. I was increasingly worried about Jamie's behavior and her inappropriate relationship with her boss. The private investigator had already been on the case for at least two weeks by then, and I was anxious about Jamie's behavior when she was away from me for a week, even with her peers. Mama Connie, who doesn't have a job outside her and Dad's home, agreed readily to accompany the younger women. What about Nag's head? Mary Jo inquired. Instead of directly responding to her, I lifted my hand, holding the remote control for our cutting-edge stereo entertainment system. With a single click, I conveyed the information I'd acquired from my private investigator, complete with authentic audio accompaniment. I had requested the transcript of the forthcoming playback to be included in the packet I gave to Roy. However, the conversational evidence gains a sense of authenticity when heard directly from the source. I preface the forthcoming audio with, This recording was captured from the neighboring vacation condo's patio, separated by a privacy fence, using a high-quality parabolic microphone. The recording then played the sounds of the seashore, passing cars and occasional noises from children at the pool in the adjacent condo. Mary Jo, you're not really engaging in that behavior, are you? I thought you and Clint were, well, solid. Jamie. Oh, we are. It's just that being with Doug feels exhilarating and naughty. I know it's temporary. I'll indulge in this forbidden experience, and then it'll be over soon. I'll remain committed to Clint forever. Mary Jo. Until the next temptation, you mean? Jamie. No, there won't be a next time. This is a one-time thing. Trust me, girlfriend. Once I end it with Doug, or he ends it first, that's it. I'll refocus, stop taking birth control, and Clint and I can start building our family as we've planned. Mary Jo. I... I'm just surprised, Jamie. This isn't like you. I couldn't betray Roy like that. He'd feel humiliated, angry, and question his manhood compared to the other guy I'd be cheating with. Speaking of which, are you with this guy because of... Jamie. Oh no. Clint is a much better partner, both emotionally and physically, than Doug. It's just the thrill of the situation and the novelty, I suppose, and the excitement of being a little naughty before settling down with Clint for the rest of my life. Mary Jo. Which might not last long if he discovers. Jamie, after a brief pause. You're... you're not planning to betray me, are you? Mary Jo, letting out a sigh audible even from the distance of the fence and fifteen feet away, according to the P.I.'s microphone. No, I won't betray you, but I'm not going to actively lie either, understand? I pressed the remote, halting the playback. As the excerpt of their conversation from weeks ago in North Carolina played, I observed Mary Jo's expression darken while Roy's grew more hostile. You despicable person, Roy exclaimed. You had no authority to spy on and record my wife. 
I should take legal action against you for invading our privacy or enough. As Ronald Reagan stated during the Republican primary debates in 1980, I paid for this microphone. Additionally, I was the rightful owner of the timeshare swap. Furthermore, suspecting Jamie of infidelity, I purchased a second resort week, which I assigned to my private investigator. Hence, he had full legitimacy to be present and record Nature Sounds of the Beach. It's unfortunate that my unfaithful, soon-to-be ex-wife and your wife, who was all too willing to cover for an adulterer, happened to converse while my P.I. was testing his equipment on the adjacent patio of our vacation unit. I leaned back and paused briefly before continuing, and the judge in Charlotte was quite understanding of my situation, considering that conversation also occurred in North Carolina. Roy was visibly furious now. Well, you can just take these papers and shove them up your ass, bud. I'm not allowing you to drag my wife into court and publicly humiliate her, even if it does happen in Charlotte. I grinned and retrieved another hefty envelope, pushing it across the table toward him. Oh, she won't be the only one facing public embarrassment. Bud! Roy angrily grabbed the second envelope, nearly tearing it open to reveal its contents. Within seconds, he was on his feet, spitting out his words. You son of a bitch, you must be out of your mind. You've been served too, fool, I replied as calmly as I could, though my anger towards Roy and his involvement in the situation was boiling beneath the surface, something he was about to discover. What do you mean by intentional infliction of emotional distress? Roy yelled. I grinned at him and remarked, Essentially, in states where alienation of affections lawsuits aren't permitted, they often allow for legal action under intentional infliction of emotional distress, IIED laws, and Tennessee is among them. This is where I take legal action against you for what's termed as outrageous conduct with the intent to cause or reckless disregard for the likelihood of causing emotional distress to the plaintiff. That's me and that the plaintiff suffers severe or extreme emotional distress, and that the defendant's outrageous conduct is the actual and proximate cause of the emotional distress, you being the defendant, you jerk. Emotional distress encompasses mental suffering, anguish, and all other highly unpleasant mental responses, including fear, nervousness, grief, anxiety, worry, embarrassment, shock, humiliation, and indignity, as well as physical pain. Trust me, my lawyer and I have thoroughly reviewed this, and I've studied it extensively. When have I ever done anything remotely like that to you, you bastard? Roy yelled. I raised the remote once more and proposed, how about meeting at the wagon wheel where you're aware I'm a regular? You jerk. I anticipated that Mary Jo, being as talkative as she is, would at least spill the beans about Jamie's affair so I instructed the P.I. to keep tabs on both of you and your conversations about me. With a click of the remote, the sound system emanated the bustling ambiance of a bar, allowing us all to hear Roy's distinctive Tennessee-infused New York accent booming through the room. The recorded dialogue suggested that Roy had been commanding attention during the gathering. Roy. Yeah, she's off having an affair with her boss while the clueless guy is at home, content in his ignorance. Mary Jo. Roy, please, I promised Jamie we wouldn't expose her, if you don't stop. Another man. And your friend is named Clint, right? Is it Clint Hood, the guy who hangs out here a few times a week? He joins me and some buddies for darts and pool every now and then. Roy. Yep, that's him. He's really a friend. A foolish one, but still a friend. It's amusing to have him around, to beat him at golf and gossip about, while his wife and her boss take advantage of him. In response, the audio Roy prompted the bar patrons to burst into mocking laughter. I pressed the remote and turned to him. Well, buddy, I suppose I must be quite the entertainment to have around and mock in a crowd where I'm rather well known, given how much time I used to spend there in my leisure. Well, I used to. Now, thanks to Jamie's actions and your big mouth, I'll have to find a new spot to hang out, where I can enjoy a beer, some pool, and darts, alongside any new friends I might come across after I take legal action against you and sever ties as a friend. Oh, that's right. 
I added with a sardonic grin. I've already taken care of that. I presented another document to Unanclosid. This is the initial report from a therapist my lawyer arranged for me to see last week, I explained. It asserts quite conclusively that I'm experiencing emotional distress in various forms, mental anguish, grief, anxiety, humiliation, and indignity, all contributing to the onset of acid reflux, which serves as evidence of the deterioration of my physical health. Roy and Mary Jo stood up, visibly angry and embarrassed, but said nothing. Speaking quietly to them, I added, Feel free to leave, and I'll see you in court. Roy, still trembling with anger, watched as Mary Jo collected the documents they had been given. She gently touched his elbow, and they exchanged a look. She mouthed, Let's go, and they headed for the door. Roy exited first, and Mary Jo glanced back before following. I caught her murmuring softly, I'm sorry just before the storm door closed quietly behind her. Several weeks earlier, thwack. The effortless swing and graceful follow-through of Larry Klug always left me envious whenever he gripped a driver. His consistently powerful tee shots often compensated for his subpar wedge play and other shortcomings in his short game, allowing him to typically dominate our rounds on the course. We were at the driving range, both taking swings at a bucket of balls while engaging in light-hearted conversation. At this juncture in my life, I was yearning for the companionship of friends and some form of diversionary chatter and activity. Larry and I first crossed paths more than 10 years ago during our college days at UT Chattanooga, where we shared a few classes. Despite maintaining a decent relationship since then, it wasn't until we both joined the same country club shortly before his marriage to Angela that we truly bonded. After receiving an invitation to their wedding, I reciprocated a year later by inviting them to ours when Jamie and I tied the knot. Since then, our friendship has deepened to the point where they've become one of our favorite couples to spend time with, sharing life's experiences and relaxing together. As he glanced up to watch his ball soar toward the 300-yard marker, he muttered, I'd dump the woman and metaphorically burn her at the stake. Fair enough. But how do you deal with the fact that, despite her being unfaithful, deceitful, and dishonest, someone you've invested years of love into, which doesn't just vanish overnight or even over months or possibly years? I was never getting my emotions here, having already come to terms with Jami's infidelity and the impending end of our marriage. But, despite my anger towards God, as painful as it was, I still felt hurt. I had truly loved Jamie with all my heart, and to be honest, I still do even after her infidelity. I just needed to seek the perspectives of other people whom I trusted so that I could make the necessary decisions without feeling so... so... isolated, I suppose. Simple, Larry responded as he set another golf ball on the tee next to mine. He stood up to speak to me before addressing the ball and continued, well, maybe not quite so simple. The poor guy might continue loving her to some extent for the rest of his life. But the wise man follows one of the fundamental economic principles. Never attempt to recover a sunk cost or invest more resources into a failing endeavor with the hope of returning to the initial state. It just doesn't happen. Pausing before swinging his driver, Larry inquired, Why the sudden interest in unfaithful partners? You're not... No, I responded quickly. I... Just, and then I fabricated, heard rumors about a colleague at my workplace, that his wife might be having an affair with someone named Jody, and I was just pondering what advice to give him if he were to seek my opinion on it. So, I'm consulting a few friends to gather their thoughts as I figure out my own stance, that is, if I choose to say anything at all. This explanation seemed to calm Larry. He simply nodded and focused on his golf shot. Then he executed another one of those flawless drives that filled me with envy. Larry cast a sympathetic glance my way as we all listened to Roy and Mary Jo's car starting outside at the top of the sloping driveway leading down to my house. Angela remained quiet, her gaze fixed on the center of the coffee table. The glasses left on the table had gathered condensation, causing droplets to form around the coasters, though they remained safely on the polished wood surface. 
Memories flooded back of Jamie's fussing whenever moisture spots appeared on the furniture. Mama Connie softly inquired if Dad wanted another beer, to which he declined with a shake of his head, offering me his own sympathetic look. The silence was broken by Angela's voice, addressing me directly. So, Clint, you're not just divorcing your wife. You're divorcing your friends, too? Her tone wasn't outright accusatory, but it certainly lacked the support one might expect. Angela, you and Larry are Catholics, correct? I inquired, catching them off guard with the seemingly unrelated question. Yeah, but what's that got to do with... Larry started, his expression mildly confused. Are you familiar with the Catholic concept of excommunication? I asked. Yeah, it's when the church excludes you. Larry began to explain. No, I interrupted. I may be just a Methodist, but even I understand that according to the Catholic Church, a member essentially excommunicates themselves by voluntarily abstaining from actions, thoughts, and practices that would typically maintain their full communion with the rest of the Catholic faith community. I leaned forward as I continued speaking. Official excommunication by the Church essentially amounts to publicly acknowledging that the individual in question has willingly distanced themselves from complete communion with the Church from the outset. Drawing a parallel to divorce proceedings, I went on, redirecting the analogy to our current situation, the court simply formalizes and publicly acknowledges that one or both parties have already disengaged from full participation in the marriage. In my legal axioms against Roy and Mary Jo, I clarified, I am merely seeking formal recognition from the courts, and ideally as publicly and embarrassingly as possible for those two individuals, that they voluntarily severed ties with my friendship through their actions, both their direct involvement and their intentional negligence in addressing the circumstances that led to my divorce from Jamie. The rest remained silent for a moment, processing the information I had just outlined in my mind. The quiet was interrupted by the rustle of the next large envelope I threw onto the coffee table. Larry glanced up, catching the sorrow in my expression as our eyes met, his brow furrowed, a puzzled expression forming until he followed my gaze toward Angela, noticing the tension in my mouth. Angela's expression shifted suddenly to one of fear as she darted her eyes between me and Larry, silently pleading. It seemed she had an inkling of what might be contained in that ominous envelope. Are you divorcing us as well, Clint? Larry asked sadly, his gaze shifting between the envelope, Angela, and then back to me. I opened my mouth to speak but my words stumbled momentarily, and I had to blink back the onset of tears. I understood the pain this revelation would cause my friend. Yet if I didn't follow through with my plan, I would be complicit like those I was confronting tonight. It would make me a hypocrite. No, I finally replied, then cleared my throat and continued. Just her. I glanced pointedly at Angela, who had closed her eyes and shook her head as if trying to deny what was unfolding. What do you mean? Just her. I... What? Angela. Larry was clearly caught off guard. At that moment, all Angela could manage was a soft repetition of, No, 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 no. I'm sorry, Larry, I said, but you need to know. With that, I pressed the remote to play the next recording in line. The sound of waves and the occasional seagull, followed by the sliding patio door closing, presumably to keep the air conditioning in and the mosquitoes out. Angela. Hey, girlfriend. Why are you sitting out here all alone on such a beautiful evening, reflecting on how much you miss Clint? Pause. Or how much you miss Doug? Jamie. Shut. Up. Girl. Sound of patio chairs sliding. I was just contemplating whether I made a huge mistake by confirming Mary Jo's suspicions about Doug and me. Angela. You mean you admitted it to her? Jamie. Well, I just acknowledged it when she asked. She seemed to already have it all figured out. But she promised not to spill the beans. Angela, after a very audible snort. Yeah, right. Knowing Mary Jo's tendency to gossip, she'll probably spill it to Roy right away. And as for Roy, Jamie. If that happens, I hope Roy sticks to the man code. Angela. Man code. What do you mean? 
Jamie. Roy won't tell Clint the truth to prevent Clint from hating him for delivering bad news. Angela. I hope your prediction is accurate. Pause. By the way, I haven't shared this with anyone else since you first confided in me about it, when you and Doug first got together. Jamie. I appreciate that, girlfriend. Although, I suspect part of your motivation in assisting me is repayment for my support, when your situation almost spiraled out of control. Angela. Oh, Jamie. Trust me when I say I'm genuinely thankful for your help at the New Year's event at the country club. I don't typically drink that much, and if you hadn't assisted me in cleaning up after you found Javier and me behind the pro shop that night, Larry would have surely divorced me. He might have even uncovered the fact that Javier, as the club's CEO, had been arranging our meetings in the club's guest bungalows for almost a year. I switched off the recording. The background filled with the chirping of crickets and the croaking of bullfrogs for the next 15 seconds. Then came the sound of Angela's breathing, growing heavier and louder as she neared the brink of breaking into sobs. Larry simply lowered his face into his hands as Angela approached, but refrained from touching her tormented husband. She murmured softly, struggling to articulate coherent sentences amid her surprise and, I could only hope, shame. No, Larry. It's not, I mean, her words faltered. Is the transcript in here? Larry finally looked up at me, his expression thankfully not accusatory but rather devoid of emotion altogether. Yeah, I replied softly, along with a CDR containing the audio and a signed affidavit from my PI confirming its authenticity. Thank you, Clint, Larry said at last, offering a brief glance at his wife before rising and extending his hand to me. You're a true friend for letting me know. Don't worry about me being angry at the messenger. Let's go home, Angela. You'll need some time to pack, Larry said as he headed towards the door, seemingly unconcerned about whether his current wife would follow. Angela glanced at me, her anguish over the impending loss of her husband mingled with fierce anger directed at me. Are you satisfied, asshole? She spat before turning to follow Larry out. I doubted she heard me when I softly replied, No, not really. The previous week. If she's being that obvious about it, then I suppose the best course of action is to end the relationship while you're still young enough to start fresh once things settle down for you. I had just outlined my plan to divorce Jamie to Dad and Mama Connie, swearing them to secrecy until Jamie could be formally served. Assuring them that my private investigator had provided more than enough evidence to support my case, I explained that I intended to serve her with divorce papers the following week and have her moved out of my house as soon as possible thereafter. I thanked God for Grandad's foresight in leaving the house solely to me before I had married Jamie. I was only halfway through deciding what to do about our former so-called friends, so I refrained from informing my parents about that part. Reflecting on the past, I realized that Mama Connie proved to be a great companion for Dad following Mom's tragic death due to a drunk driver when I was just four years old. Mama Connie herself had experienced loss, having lost her first husband in Operation Desert Storm in the 90s. She and Dad crossed paths at a charity dinner, and their relationship blossomed over a year and a half before they decided to marry. It's quite surreal to think about being the best man at a wedding when you're not even seven years old yet. Dad and I often chuckled at the photos from his and Mama Connie's wedding album, especially the one where there's a noticeable gap in the line of heads among the wedding party which included me. Are you certain you two can't navigate through these regrettable circumstances, Clint, honey? Mama Connie asked with genuine concern. Being unable to conceive children herself and with me being her only child, I suppose she was desperately hoping to keep Jamie and me together long enough to fulfill one of her deepest desires in life, to have grandchildren who could help fill the void left by not having her own children. Regrettable circumstances, I pondered. What exactly was she referring to? I had just informed her that Jamie had been having an affair with her boss for months. That wasn't regrettable. It was intentionally disgraceful. I'm sorry, Mama Connie, I replied as tactfully as possible. If it had only been a harmless flirtation without becoming physical, and if she hadn't gone to such lengths, not just to conceal it from me, but to enlist others to help cover up her infidelity. No, we're finished. I'm sorry. 
Mama Connie rose to assist in tidying the living room, collecting the glasses left behind by my former close friends. She wiped down the coasters and neatly stacked them before heading back to the kitchen. As she departed, Dad mustered the energy to address me with what he had been meaning to say. Well, son, you're certainly severing ties here. You filed for divorce from Jamay, served two of your friends with lawsuits for alienation of affections, and one for Aid. Have I covered everything? I understand that he intended to convey facts with a hint of humor, aiming to boost my morale. He likely believed he had imparted enough survival skills to me, both in the wilderness during my youth and emotionally through his guidance as I grew older. The assurance in his expression suggested he was confident things would resolve positively. That's likely why he paled and nearly dropped his beer when I handed him my final envelope, saying, Almost. It was now fully dark outside, with the beacon light atop Lookout Mountain flickering in the distance, accompanied by the distant glow of the city on the horizon. Reaching the top of the driveway, I headed towards my truck, intending to find a new bar to spend some time in, away from home, and enjoy a couple of beers. Glancing back at the house, I peered through the front picture window. Dad held the contents of the envelope in his hand, including the transcript of another conversation my private investigator had recorded during that eventful week at the Outer Banks. His expression conveyed a mix of disbelief and anger, while Mama Connie's face reflected anguish and misery. I started the powerful Cummins diesel engine and drove away from the curb, unconcerned about leaving them at home. I knew Dad had a key and would lock up when they departed. That's the end of the story. Write your opinion in the comments about this story. It will be interesting for us to read it. Also, do not forget to like and subscribe to our channel so as not to miss new, equally interesting and exciting stories. Good luck!